Well, hello and welcome to episode 60. I saw the shows on CNN about the history of comedy, one being on the women who broke down the entry barriers to becoming a comedian, such as Imogene Coca, Moms Mabley, Lucille Ball, Carol Burnett, Phyllis Diller, Joan Rivers, Marilyn Miller, Gracie Allen, Elaine May, and Whoopi Goldberg, etc. I could go on and on. It was quite an entertaining show, and the other show was titled Gone Too Soon on the incredible amount of comedians that died young, which was notable to me since there seems to be something symptomatic about it and disturbing, very likely due to the lifestyle of being on the road, the drugs, the alcohol. It's a very long list, which includes Robin Williams, Lenny Bruce, Greg Giraldo, Mitch Hedberg, John Belushi, Freddie Prinze, Bernie Mac, Chris Farley, Sam Kinison, Robert Schimmel, Andy Kaufman, Patrice O'Neill, Gilda Radner, Bill Hicks, John Candy, Phil Hartman, Gary Shandling, Richard Jenny, John Panette, and Ralphie, Bay, Ralphie May. And it's also revealing when you note that there was only one woman on that list. And I may have missed a few here, but one thing is for sure, these comedians were all extremely talented. And there's something remarkably significant and pronounced about these people who could make you laugh and sometimes even bring on tears of joy. And as one person claimed, if you can make someone laugh, even just once you have them, they will not forget you. For me, it's one of the most indelible of all art forms, particularly because it makes you smile, laugh, and it reveals the absurdity, fragility, and preposterousness of human life and behavior. Comedians observe and record these implausible, goofy, and outrageous interactions of daily life. And where the hell would we be without comedy and comedians? God bless them all. I recall being very young and watching black and white TV and making the connection with all of the original comedians back in the late 1950s and early 1960s, you know, a long time ago. It left an enduring mark on me, and it's deeply embedded in me. I sincerely miss all of those people that died so young. The world is always deeply in need of your services and misses all of the extraordinary talent that has left us, and they can never really be replaced. It's just too large of a void to ever restore. When my mind drifts, which is not unusual for me, and I imagine the same with just about anyone else, I find I absolutely, absolutely despise poor communication. Yet, strangely enough, I believe that we're all poor communicators since honest and effective communication is hard to achieve and we're not very good at it simply because life doesn't allow it in its never-ending flow of occurrences, shifting landscapes and perceptions. Every day existence is a labyrinth as we blindly move and jostle through our emotions, the ever-changing flow of life, the miscues, the misunderstandings, and the inability to adapt to the instantaneous changes. So in my antagonism of faulty communication, I realized that in some way we're all poor communicators. We make do and hope for the best. And some of us come to realize that it's mostly an illusion, an endless sea of transient occurrences that continually advance and shift quickly, quicker than we can digest. In summary, all I can say is good luck out there and I hope you understand what I'm saying because if I read this a thousand times, I would most likely perceive it differently each time. I won't go into a lot of details with this subject, but no surprise that FIFA, who is not the most honorable sports body in the world, fell for Qatar as the home for the 2022 World Cup. Qatar is a corrupt, oil-rich, and extremely oppressive society under caliphate rule. It was a very poor choice, and I won't go in again to too many details, but I don't see the point of having the World Cup there since they use and abuse migrant workers to build the eight stadiums under extreme conditions one being the heat, which can reach temperatures exceeding 120 degrees, along with the horrible facilities that were provided. Some estimates claim that approximately 6,500 6, workers died during the building, but some other estimates were lower. We may never really know. And all of these migrant workers were very poor and were naturally attracted to the wages to be able to send money back to their families. And despite the early stages of the development, they lived under extremely squalid circumstances, and for the hundreds or thousands of poor families from South Asia, India, and Africa, the people who suffered the loss of family members were not compensated appropriately, which was and is criminal. I was never a big fan of FIFA, and as always, it's all about money. 
I'm fortunate and glad to be alive at 69. I turned 69 today, but not really happy to be 69. Yes, I'm relatively healthy and living well, but so much of the energy, health, spontaneity, friends, thought processes, and socializing is fading away as the days race by. And it's hard connecting to old friends who are far away and even with the ones close by since they're going through the same changes and they have their own lives to live. It's lonely. And I happened to see a segment on one of the morning shows on how active the 55 dating scene is. And I thought to myself, I don't know and I don't believe, God forbid, that I could ever replace my wife because if I did start dating someone new, I wouldn't be able to help myself from comparing this woman to Mary. And that is one Herculean task for any, any woman. <coughs> Excuse me. Like any partner in life, you have disagreements and any marriage can drive you to madness as everyone has their own standards and peculiarities. Sometimes I'm even ashamed at the things I do and say, but we always walk away and take a breather and we're fine a few weeks later. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, of course. It's really more like five or 10 minutes. I do have my obsessions and I'm not what I was before. The mind is going a bit and I can be forgetful. And she's usually three steps ahead of me. She is not replaceable. After all the 38 years of being together, I really don't think that any woman out there could fill her void. It would be, a, to me, synonymous with filling the Grand Canyon. And on the flip side, Mary could fill my void quite easily, I'm sure. And I would never be able to replace her cooking. It's really good all the time. But of course, I really don't think I will outlive her. She has a lot of longevity in her family, much more than we do. And who would ever marry me? You would have to be out of your freaking mind to marry me. <laughs> I get along with my wife very well. Here we go again about my wife. We're both veterans of a guerrilla war we never understood. And that's from the Joan Didion's book, Slouching Toward Bethlehem. It fits, and the other saying it reminds me of is familiarity breeds contempt, or Jean-Paul Sartre's hell is other people. And I should call her Mary from now on. The term my wife is a bit chauvinistic. Anyway, we're both sticklers coming from different, from different characteristics, backgrounds, separate preferences, degrees of certitude, and so on. It's a long list. She is also less trusting than I am, which has taught me some lessons over the years, and I spend a certain amount of time in an alternative world where my head and heart slides into another realm, and all of this is strange to Mary. We're both realists, but we both have our outlets and escapes. People need them. And who the hell knows? Maybe I have her all wrong. You never really know another person. But through it all, we've survived. And I will stop here.